Eddie. Really glad you could join us tonight. Looking forward as people join the chat, if you'd please let us know you're here. We want to make sure we know where folks are coming from and, um, and who you are. Uh, I know we've got several folks online already from Our Evolution Massachusetts's Green New Deal Working Group, but I'm looking forward to seeing who else joins in. We've got a great lineup tonight. There's a question on the screen. If you're watching, um, uh, please, in the chat, let us know what you think the estimates are. Um, there's, uh, there's money that the government is giving away, both federal and state, every year to the fossil fuel criminals. What do you think that number is? And how much do you think they subsidize, we subsidize renewables every year? Looking forward to seeing everybody here tonight. Mark, thanks for that. Thanks for that estimate, Mark. Welcome. Where are you from, Mark? Alex, welcome aboard. Glad to see you tonight. Fergus, welcome. Ferg, great to see you. Western Mass is in the house. Uh, Franklin County continues the political revolution. Welcome, Haley. So glad you could all be with us tonight. We're going to have a great program. Um, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot of actions to take. Um, this is, uh, this is not just a deliver information for your entertainment event. We're looking forward to you inv being involved. Jane, welcome. Jeff, glad to have you here. Lori, Linda, Liv, please shout out in the, in the chat where you're from. Thanks for those estimates, Fergus. Glenn, welcome from Greenfield. Greenfield's in the house. We're gonna start the program momentarily. Just take a chance, kid. tell us what you think the estimates are um, for how much money the federal government gives away every year to the fossil fuel companies and subsidies and how much for renewables. Welcome, Tim. O.R. Newton is in the house. Newton, Watertown, Waltham. Um, hello, Llewellyn. Barbara from Hamtramck, Hem Michigan. Welcome from Michigan, Barbara. Sheila, welcome. Blue Ridge Mountains, Virginia is in the house tonight. Shrewsbury, welcome. Glad to have you, Sina. Sienna. Ferd, good to, thanks for, thanks, Ferd. Okay, everyone, we really need to get underway. I really appreciate everybody joining us tonight. I want to welcome you. Um, before I move on, just so you have the numbers, in direct subsidies, the federal government gives $15 billion or more a year to the fossil fuel industry, while it gives approximately $1.1 billion for renewables. That's just the estimates for direct subsidies. If you add it all up, it's hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, that goes to you know, in underwriting the fossil fuel industry and basically using our tax dollars to finance the climate crisis. Um, there is a site, I, uh, I, hopefully we can get somebody to paste the link um, called generation180.org that has much more detail on this. So let's move on. We're sponsored tonight by a group of organizations that have come together um, in the struggle to, to, to hold the climate criminals accountable. Key sponsors tonight include Food and Water Action, um, who you'll hear from in a moment. Climate Finance Action is gonna talk about a variety of strategies um, for in involving public pension funds. Mass Call to Action, which has been organizing around the state on various issues. And a late addition to the sponsors list is 350 Mass. Um, we're really grateful that they've chosen to join us tonight. Um, before we actually start the program, 
I'm going to ask Chris from Our Revolution Blue Hills to give us the invocation for tonight. Chris, you're on. Hello. Good evening, everyone. We recognize that we meet this evening on lands taken from indigenous people, many of whom sit on land unceded to colonial powers, despite attempts at erasing their way of life. We affirm our solidarity with the water protectors and indigenous people, such as the Anishinaabe collection of North American tribes, as well as our more local brothers and sisters. Tribes such as the Massachusetts, Mashpee, Pakumtuk, Wampanoag and the Narragansett peoples. We recognize that we live within the American capitalist system founded on slavery, a system that established a legacy of violence and selfish acquisition that includes environmental destruction, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and economic inequality. We endeavor to create a culture that recognizes that everyone should have a right to health care affordable homes, and clean water. We recognize that we are all part of one earth and shared ecosystems. What happens in the Brazilian Amazon, India, China, or other parts of the world we may never visit affects us all. Through forums like this one, we endeavor to educate the public on these complex issues and their power to stop damage to land, water, air, and life. We see constructive solutions regarding a new way towards sustainable renewal. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, the, it, it, it's important for us to recognize where we sit and why. Um, our agenda tonight includes five basic sections. Um, the first four really have to do with the program and then we'll follow up at the end with next steps. Uh, I'm not going to try and read through all of that text on the, the slide because it's on the slide, so I don't have to. Um, what's important about tonight is you'll notice for each of the three main content sections, there's an action minute. We're going to post at the end of each of those sections one or two links in the chat and ask you to take action on each of those items. Please do it as quickly as you can. It's either petitions or pre-formatted letters to various congressional officials or state representatives um, and other organizations or at the very end ways to support the ongoing struggle against line three in Minnesota. Um, take those actions. If you don't have the time, save the link. Open that window anyway and then take care of the action afterwards. But it's important that we treat this as a, not just an information delivery opportunity, but as an opportunity to mobilize each other. Um, and as you take those actions, please shout out in the chat that you've done so. Um, we're going to move on right now to the first section of the program. We're going to ask um, for you to be, before we do one quick housekeeping note, thanks. Um, it's important that um, we recognize the support that Our Revolution National gives to Our Revolution Massachusetts. It's there. Um, video stream and, and background technology that's keeping us alive tonight um, and making this happen. Um, but what we need each of you to do is to become a movement builder, a, con a contributing member of our revolution. Um, the, the, the link is simple. It's uh, ourrev.us slash ma mem, as in Massachusetts member, ma mem. Um, please go to that link tonight do what you can to support Our Revolution National. There, Hal will talk more at the end of the program about what is going on on the national scene and, and how those resources are being used. Um, thanks so much, Hal, for all the work that OR National is doing for us tonight. Um, let's move on. Um, Thomas Meyer is the National Organizing Manager for Food and Water Action. Um, and he's going to talk to us. He's one of the, the, their organization and their sister organization, Food and Water Watch, are two of the key organizations fighting to end a, a variety of environmental deg degradations, but we're closely involved with them on the effort to stop um, federal fossil fuel subsidies. And Hal's going to talk a little bit now about the urgency of the problems we face and then later about the fossil fuel subsidy work. Okay, Thomas, take, on, take it on. Great. Thank you, Michael. And um, yeah, hey, everyone. Good evening. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, so again, my name is Thomas. I'm the National Organizing Manager at Food and Water Action and Food and Water Watch. Um, we mobilize regular people to build political power 
uh, to move bold and uncompromised solutions to the most pressing food and water and climate problems of our time. And uh, like Michael just said, um, our work is, is focused a lot on addressing um, and confronting the, the fossil fuel industry and the climate crisis. Um, I live on occupied Duwamish land, also known as Seattle. And as you probably know, the, the Pacific Northwest um, just went through a really a, a brutal and historic heat wave that smashed records um, in many cities. Uh, oh, you wanna go to the next slide? Um, and scientists actually confirmed, I was just talking to a, to a friend who worked on this, that um, the heat wave here in the Northwest was almost entirely the result of, of man-made climate change. We can, we can kind of work it out with the models that um, this heat wave was, was not sort of a, a normal fluke, um, but really directly a result of, of man-made climate change. And of course, you know, the climate crisis is happening here and now. We're not seeing just heat waves, but devastating events on an almost daily basis uh, are really the direct result of the fossil fuel industry operations and their decades of denial and misinformation and obstruction. There's a trend uh, now among some um, climate activists and even some journalists to rename uh, fires and, and hurricanes and other uh, climate disasters after fossil fuel companies. And I, I just wanted to mention that because it's a really accurate depiction of, of who's responsible, what's responsible for the problems that we're seeing every day. And so I, I drew it out on this slide. If you want to go to the next slide, um, consider, you know, every oil well, every refinery, every pipeline, every power plant, just draw a direct line to the headlines that we see about uh, so-called natural disasters. Um, you know, the media is, is increasingly making this connection, but, but not quite enough. Um, but consider every time you see the headline um, on the right, you know, the cause of it, uh, like you've seen on the, on the left. So, you know, I won't sugarcoat it. Many of you are probably aware we are in a really bad position <laughs> when it comes to climate change. The United States has made next to no progress in reducing emissions or winding down the use of fossil fuels. Um, and unfortunately, elected officials and governments at, at almost every level are actually encouraging more oil drilling and fracking and pipelines and power plants um, and other elements of the fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, fortunately, you know, we are a part, Food and Water Action and, and the other organizations here are a part of, I would say, a, a quite vibrant and growing climate and environmental justice movement that have stopped a lot of individual projects, you know, like pipelines and power plants and, and plans for, for new drilling. Um, but until we actually mandate the end of fossil fuel extraction, the end of new fossil fuel infrastructure projects at the federal level, we'll basically be swimming upstream against just an increasingly raging rapid. Um, and so tonight, you know, we're going to talk about, in addition to fighting, you know, permits and approvals for specific fossil fuel projects, um, like pipelines, power plants, et cetera, it's really critical that we cut off the flow of funding to the industry as well. And there's a variety of sources, you know, where the industry um, gets money. There's, of course, a huge amount of private capital from, from banks and other investors. But there's also amount, a, a tre tremendous amount of, of public funding that is propping up the fossil fuel industry. Um, and so, you know, we'll go into more detail later and you'll hear from um, another speaker and then myself about um, two main areas to focus on. So one is sort of institutional investments that support the fossil fuel industry through things like pension funds and endowments. Uh, and the second are actually direct subsidies or tax breaks or tax loopholes that actually have existed in federal law for decades. And they're there specifically for the benefit of the fossil fuel industry. And so ending both of these kind of pillars of financial support for the industry are really, really critical um, in order for us to rapidly not only reduce carbon emissions, but actually wind down the existence of the, the fossil fuel industry itself. You want to go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to share more, more later about the specific campaign, but I just want to kind of show this juxtaposition. There is a physical reality of the climate crisis that we're seeing every day around the world and here in the United States. I mentioned the heat wave, the flooding, the wildfires. It, it can be uh, overwhelming, certainly, to, to live through it on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Um, but of course, the political reality, especially in Congress, is just totally out of sync with the physical reality. These are, like I said, headlines from the same day just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and we know, of course, Joe Manchin has <laughs> been an issue on this, but it's not just him. Um, like I said, the, the political reality and the physical reality do not match. And our job is to change that political reality to match the urgency of the climate crisis itself. Um, and, and it's an, it's an uphill battle, but I know that, you know, my, my colleagues and our allies, you know, at Food and Water Action and, and many, many other organizations have done this before. I've been a part of our campaign to ban fracking in Maryland, my colleagues before that ban fracking in New York, hundreds of other communities across the country. And, and in almost every one of those instances, many folks said it was impossible. We're not, you're not going to be able to ban fracking, um, in New York or in Maryland or, you know, fill in the blank city or county across the country. Um, but we have done that. We can make what seems to be politically impossible possible uh, if we focus on organizing, if we focus on mobilizing and, and putting pressure on elected officials who, who have a say in, in these key decisions. And I know that's a, the big focus for, for our revolution and, and many of the folks that you work with uh, on the ground in Massachusetts and across the country. So I just wanted to leave you with that. And, and again, sort of stress that our job is to, is to force the political reality to match the, the physical reality that we're seeing, you know, out our windows and, and on the headlines every day. Um, so thank you all for joining tonight. We're going to talk more about specific legislation and, and strategy and, and ways to get involved. And actually folks in Massachusetts have a really important role in that. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but um, thank you all for, for being here and for joining this important fight. Thank you so much, Thomas. As Greta Thunberg has said, um, our house really is on fire and uh, it is it is time to stop talking about what kind of hose to use and actually start taking real actions um, to, to, to remove the fuel that supports that fire. Um, one of the organizations that's doing major work around the country um, focused on a variety of aspects of, of what we might call global finance and how that supports the, um, the crisis in the fossil fuel industry is climate finance action. Um, in a second, you're going to hear from Mary Cerulli, who's the director and I believe co-founder of CFA. Um, Mary has been leading work around the country and particularly here in Massachusetts targeting um, the power that pension, public pension funds have um, it's not just how they're invested, but the fact that those shares, the, the financial world wants to manage that money. Um, and so um, who those money managers are and how they behave becomes an opportunity for us to use the power of public pensions, of public monies, often public tax dollars that have been paid to teachers and firefighters and police officers um, and then contributed back to those pension funds to use that power to demand that those financial organizations, and she's going to tell you more about who in just a second, um, to demand that they do the right thing and start turning off the fuel valve, cutting off the, turning off the spigot um, to dampen down the fires. Um, Mary, let's hear about how pensions and, and the other work CFA is doing can be important and how we can help support it. Great. Uh, thank you so much. You can go to the next slide. And so just like Michael said, using the power of public money to fight climate change is, um, is it, it, it's um, so important to do along with everything else that all these great activists are involved in. And so the next slide, I'll just uh, let you know that we're going to focus on the role of money in climate change, shareholder power, uh, and the key role that states play, and um, tonight, more importantly, um, uh, Massachusetts, and the most important climate official you've never heard of, and then what you can do to make it work. So um, for as long as there's been a fossil fuel industry, it's always, always been deeply um, bound up with the finance sector. And so despite the uh, urgency that we all know, and Thomas really laid out well, um, is the, uh, it, it continues to expand its investments in and financing for fossil fuels and deforestation companies. Um, and sometimes big investors and banks will say these pretty words, but about what 
should be done, but really they just go on as business as usual. And so banks keep lending money to polluting operations and companies and investors buy stock in drilling companies and shareholders vote to approve CEO pay packages, no matter how much coal or gas a company uses. And so even today, 65% of the people uh, who sit on the boards of directors of global banks have some connection to the to slide. We'll show you, um, if you could just go to the next slide, how um, these fossil fuel companies and banks and investors have had a really cozy relationship for a long time. And so we need these big investors to put their hands back on the wheel and steer global investment away from the proverbial um, climate cliff that we're cur currently hurtling towards. And they should for economic reasons as well as ethical reasons. So climate change poses this enormous systemic risk to our economy. And so the next slide, please, you'll see that we really need to pull these two apart. And given the systemic uh, threat of climate change, the only way firm can fulfill its long-term fiduciary duty gating the climate crisis. So the next slide, please. Um, we, we, uh, we see that it's working. Addressing this money, this like pipeline um, is starting to pay off, but we need to do more of it. So shareholder power, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, this just shows you that um, over the past two years, activists around the world have been protesting, and there's been more and more scrutiny of pension funds and asset managers um, about their voting at high emitting companies and banks. And um, investors are rightly held accountable for their decisions um, and decisions made at these companies. Um, the next slide uh, shows you that um, in in Uh, there was a very broad coalition, and maybe maybe some of you joined in to pick former Exxon CEO Lee Raymond. You can see there in the lower left, that's Lee Raymond, off the chase board. And Lee Raymond's role at Exxon was the king of climate denial. And he had no place on the board of a large global bank like J.P. Morgan Chase, who also happens to be the largest bank funding fossil fuel projects and companies. And um, nine treasurers, you'll see those states at the top, um, on behalf of the state pension plans, uh, they publicly called for Lehman, for, for Lee Raymond to be um, removed, and he was. And the, the next slide will show you what happened um, this year. And, and this was really amazing because the escalator on big oil, um, it really was big oil companies were dealt a huge uh, blow. And what happened at ExxonMobil was indicative of that, of that coming apart. Um, and this year, uh, 16 state treasurers, including Massachusetts, uh, stood up to Duke Energy and its recalcitrant uh, directors, including their CEO and good. So there's been a huge change over the last couple of years. So the next slide, we'll, we'll just look really quickly at leveraging community power um, and building community power into this shareholder power. And just understanding the op openings for influence in publicly traded companies in, in a way to get these companies that affect so much to start to behave. And the good guys are really getting better um, at finding these openings and them. So just a few basics. And then next slide, what is a shareholder? So the next slide, please. Um, it's just investors and a shareholder owns shares in a public company, meaning they invest in that company. And so they own part of the company. They get a share of the, uh, the, public, the profits, 
excuse me, um, but they are also exposed to the risk. So that funny pie is just showing you that there can be large pieces of the pie and smaller pieces of the pie. So the next slide. Uh, so there's a, there's a few rules that public companies have to abide by. And one very important rule is that they have to have an annual meeting where stakeholders come together. And uh, most companies have their meeting in the spring. And so this shareholder season is um, a period of intense media focus uh, on the on these companies. And it's one of the only times of the year that shareholders and stakeholders can confront the board and senior executive team. Uh, so companies can be put on the spot legally and in the court of public opinion. And what we also mean by using this opening to push companies to change their ways on climate or face removal of their leadership. And that's what happened at Chase and Exxon and some other companies as well. And so the next slide, please. Uh, I just want you to remember that the largest shareholders have the outsized investor power. And the next slide will show you that the largest pools of money invested are pension funds. And pension funds are workers' retirement savings. And because pension funds have so much money inside them, they are some of the larger shareholders in most big companies. And they have the power to push a company to do better. The next slide just is um, uh, shows you how large all these state pension funds are, four trillion. Um, and we can go right to the next slide. Um, and and this will. Uh, I just want you to know that the pension funds rely on internal staff and external corporate asset managers to manage their money. So pension funds have huge voting powers where they invest, but also when pension funds hire asset managers to manage portions of those large funds like BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, Fidelity, um, they, all, they make huge investments with all those pension funds' money. And even though this seems really private and convoluted, there is still really public oversight. And because these are taxpayer dollars and public employee, employee retirement dollars, we can we have power. So next slide. And I want to ask you a question. Who are these people that have all this power? Who are who are these people that control all this money and, um, and who they really do have power to address climate change. Um, the next slide will show you who these folks are. Uh, this is like introducing you to the climate champions that you've could, that really could be, but you've probably never heard of them. And so if you want to put uh, something in the chat, like if you recognize any of these people, um, that would be kind of fun if anyone recognizes any of these state, tro state treasures or comptrollers. They really do have power and they oversee uh, lots of uh, these huge investments. Um, so they have a lot of votes when it comes to annual general meetings. And the items up for a vote are often climate related policy. And it includes voting for directors. Also, these large pension funds are the largest customers of the asset management asset managers I mentioned, and they wield a lot of influence. So your state treasurer has responsible has responsibility for this huge pot of money, and they have a lot of influence over how it gets invested. Next slide, please. Oh, I forgot to tell you too that all these treasurers are often elected. So let's talk a short moment about Massachusetts. You'll see that our pension fund here in Massachusetts is, is large, 90 billion. And those are just the statewide funds, the teachers, the state employees, and some of the municipal funds. We have a pro-climate electorate. And remember, money equals voting equals power. Who makes these decisions about where this money goes and what kind of power the state wants to exert? Next slide, please. Introducing our own state treasurer, Deb Goldberg. She was first elected treasurer in 2014, re-elected in 2018, and is coming up for another re-election 
in 2022. She's uh, ambitious and she also really wants to lead it uh, on climate. We've had several conversations, several meetings with her and her staff. And I believe that she really does uh, really want to do the right thing. Uh, her political aspirations are a little unclear, but she's definitely politically ambitious. So the next slide, please. Uh, her role in this ecosphere of other treasures is really important. Uh, she wants to be a leader, but she needs some pressure. So some good things. Here on the screen, you'll see that she voted against Duke Energy, uh, CEO and uh, independent board chair. She amended the proxy voting guidelines to really look at um, gender and racial diversity. And she also voted against Wells Fargo CEO, Charles Nosky. But Treasurer Goldberg and other state treasurers can do much more. So please just, uh, my last slide here is what we can do, um, what we all can do together, what we are starting to do here in Massachusetts, as well as in another dozen states. And the next slide will just show you that we really can build a bigger table, getting more people involved. Uh, and the next slide is uh, we can really engage the treasurer. Um, we've started the conversation. You can help. You can get more involved if you like. And we also are here to help support other states. We're working in many other states with... Um, with staff of Organist Thing About Massachusetts in August, so pretty soon, uh, Deb Goldberg and um, the State Pension Fund Board is going to release a report on how they're going to be responsible investors. And so we've been engaging her and we're very anxious and um, hopeful to see what uh, that report will be. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Thanks so much, Mary. It's, it's phenomenal when you consider $4 trillion and the power that that could represent. And a quick note, I'll, I'll mention that uh, while Deb Goldberg gets to vote as part of the pension board, um, so do the appointments made by Governor Baker. So it's a good note to consider making sure we don't elect another Republican. Um, there are two actions we need you to take now. Um, there is a piece of legislation currently in the Massachusetts State House called MAH2640, which is a, um, a bill that would allow pensions to divest from fossil fuel companies. Currently, Massachusetts law does not make it possible for them to make those kinds of blanket decisions. So we want you to go to the link, it's in the chat in any second now, um, and to send a letter to your state reps asking them to support H2640. Forty. If we could have that link, Garrett. Um, following up, we'll be asking you to, there we go. Um, in addition, once you've done that, it's a, it's a quick form letter. Um, if you're already in part of the Our Revolution Massachusetts database, it'll be pre-populated if you've gotten our mail before. Otherwise, it just needs your, your name, address, and um, a quick click. Um, then come back. Don't go away. Come back. Um, and take the second action. Um, in November, there'll be a summit, a climate summit in Glasgow. And that summit is probably the most important summit meeting that's happened since the Paris Accords were first signed. We all know how that didn't quite achieve what we wanted. Um, this time around, um, a large coalition that CFA is a part of called the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition um, is planning massive um, efforts to um, bring the message home to um, government leaders and corporate leaders that it's time to defund the climate crisis. Um, there will be actions around the country um, of various kinds, everything from Twitter storms and email campaigns to occupations and protests. Um, we want to encourage everybody to take part in their kickoff event on August 3rd. The link for that is on the screen. Um, and is now posted in the chat. Um, it's a quick sign up. It's a it's a another online Zoom forum. We want to urge you to take part in that action. Um, once you've done your letter, once you've taken, once you've signed up for the webinar, please populate. Let us know that in the chat. 
Um, Jane, thank you so much for taking care of that. That's really important. Every time one of us communicates to our leaders, it really does make a difference. And this is an issue they probably don't get a lot of opposition mail on, but what they do get is opposition money. Um, so we have to balance that money with our voices. Jeff, thank you for both for doing both. Sienna, thank you so much. Um, we're going to give everybody another minute or two, uh, another couple of seconds. Melissa, um, thanks for posting the links. And Garrett, um, again, please take these actions. Erica, thank you. Um, Aaron, thank you so much. Um, we're running a little bit behind, um, so. Um, We'll, we'll just take a few more seconds. Alex, thank you. Mary, thank you. Um, Diane, thank you. This is wonderful, guys. It's really making a difference. Um, the, um, uh, and I'm going too fast. <laughs> um, we've gotten one request for posting the Glasgow link a second time. Um, thank you, Ferg. Good to hear from FCCPR. Um, the, um, the Glasgow efforts um, that will be led by STMP is, it could be phenomenally important. Um, we will also keep people informed about the work we're gonna try and do to, um, to, to, to both support um, Treasurer Goldberg and to lobby the state, legis the state legislature um, to make sure that they give her the legislative power that she needs to be able to take the actions you heard Mary talk about. Um, so sign up for the Glasgow webinar, um, the 100 Days to Glasgow campaign, um, and email your state reps. Um, I think that this is great, Barbara. Thank you for taking action. Um, Cloudy, thanks for getting both of them done. Um, and now we should move on. Um, Thomas, in his original presentation, mentioned that um, there are um, and I, we, we had that initial slide up about the power of uh, government subsidies. Um, there is a direct campaign being launched across the country by a number of organizations, including Food and Water Action, Food and Water Watch, their sister organization, and several others, including Our Revolution, to break the power of those subsidies um, to um, end corporate polluter welfare um, as we know it. Um, and Thomas is gonna tell us a little bit more about the specific, specifics of that campaign, but most importantly, what we here in Massachusetts can do um, to make it a success. Michael and Zaina, thank you so much. Fergus, thanks for taking action. You're on, Thomas. Great, yeah, thanks everyone for uh, sticking with us and, and taking action along the way. Um, so yeah, like Michael said, just wanted to get into the um, specifics of the, the debate in Congress and the opportunity that we have this year. Um, so, you know, fortunately, President Biden and, and many congressional leaders have stated their support for ending fossil fuel subsidies um, and the reconciliation process, which I'm sure um, that many of you, if not all of you, have been uh, tracking or, or at least attempting to track. and. Um, so through the, you know, through the process that, you know, we're hoping Democrats will kind of go big and bold in their investments in, in climate and other um, key, you know, social, social programs, um, that legislative vehicle is our best opportunity, really the best opportunity we've had in, in years, if not decades, to actually repeal fossil fuel subsidies. Um, but just because... <laughs> Biden has said he wants it and, and, and some Senate Dems have said they want it does not mean it's going to happen. It's going to be a huge fight. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, um, two of our, our champions, uh, Bernie Sanders and Ilhan Omar, have reintroduced their bill called the End Polluter Welfare Act. And this legislation is really sort of the gold standard for the, the policies that we need to see implemented. Um, it would eliminate dozens of, of tax loopholes and giveaways that specifically benefit the fossil fuel industry and, of course, specific people. You know, fossil fuel CEOs are the ones really um, benefiting from this. And it's not small potatoes. We talked about this earlier um, in the slides. $15 billion a year in direct subsidies, many additional billions in uh, tax breaks and loopholes and other exemptions that are, are designed, again, very specifically to benefit the fossil fuel industry. And I want to kind of drive this home because I know for me, um, over the last few years, I've been working on, on climate, like I said, fighting, you know, 
fracking and pipelines and other things. And subsidies have always seemed a little bit indirect, <laughs> but this is serious, serious stuff. So one of the biggest ones that the industry really cares about is the deduction of costs for new drilling. Oil and gas companies can deduct the majority of the costs associated with drilling new wells from their tax bill. Eliminating this particular tax break would save 13, over $13 billion over 10 years, so close to a billion and a half a year, just this one tax break. And, and really, most importantly, if this tax break is repealed, it would become much more expensive and challenging for many oil and gas companies to drill new wells. That's really what we're talking about. It's not just a, sort of the, the federal balance sheet <laughs> that is at stake here. It's actually the ability of fossil fuel companies to operate the way that they have been operating for the last 150 years. So that's a really big one. Deduction of royalties paid as a foreign tax. U.S. companies that pay royalties for leases abroad. So say you're Exxon and you're, you're a multinational corporation, you're drilling off the coast of Norway. There's a big offshore drilling operation off the coast of Norway. If you pay a lease to the Norwegian government, you're allowed to deduct that cost from your U.S. taxes. And that has actually allowed, in several instances, companies like Exxon to pay zero federal income taxes, again, in large part because, of, because they were able to take advantage of this tax break. So you're actually incentivized <laughs> to be doing more drilling overseas, um, which, of course, you know, the arguments about jobs and American energy independence are, are sort of blown out of the water when you, when you consider the impact of, of, of this type of tax policy. Another one, um, companies are allowed to deduct the depreciation of certain assets over time, um, but fossil fuel companies specifically um, are able to deduct a certain percentage from their taxable income that's not related to capital costs. So basically, that's a way, uh, th this can allow deductions that actually exceed the, the total capital cost. So it's, it, it's a way, and, and Mary alluded th to this, basically, the fossil fuel industry is really sort of built on a financial bubble. <laughs> and there's specific policies like this that allow it to continue operating, even though, you know, it's massively expensive to say, drill in the Arctic or, or, or drill offshore or, you know, extract more tar sands. But because of these very specific tax loopholes are able to deduct money from their taxes, and it makes it all the more sort of affordable and, uh, and manageable. And again, eliminating what they call percentage depletion would secure, again, over a billion dollars a year, $12.9 billion over a 10-year period. So those are three big ones um, that I just mentioned that, that aren't actually direct subsidies, right, but that are tax loopholes uh, that need to be addressed and that would have a really tangible impact. And I'll just say quickly, there's other sort of indirect subsidies. The, the Federal Energy Department has a whole office called the Office of Fossil Energy <laughs> that is devoted in large part to research and development to benefit the fossil fuel industry. It's not research. It's not, they're not developing fact, you know, vaccines there. They're not building the internet, right? <laughs> it's R&D in the Office of Fossil Energy. And that, you know, again, very specifically benefits the fossil fuel industry. So that's another kind of loophole and more obscure federal program we need to end. Okay, so to get to the legislation and actually what we're going to do, um, you know, this is the kind of work here on the picture that we're talking about. Obviously, there's a lot of work. This is, kind of, this is sort of one version of it, you know, rallies and, and public demonstrations and things like that. Um, but to pass progressive legislation in Congress, we need a huge amount of grassroots activity and pressure focused at specific members of Congress. So uh, Food and Water Action and Our Revolution, in addition to many other allies, have been working together um, for months. Really, you know, this year has been a, a great opportunity to take advantage of this kind of window. But many of us have been working on this prior to that. You'll see the event we did in D.C. and then one also um, uh, Our Revolution folks came out in, in New Jersey to target Congressman Frank Pallone, who's the chair of the House Energy Committee. Um, I want to talk about uh, Massachusetts specifically, if you want to go to the next slide. So many of you probably know Western Massachusetts, the Massachusetts first district. Uh, this is Representative Richard Neal. He is the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee and has considerable power over the fate of this bu budget reconciliation bill. This, this large, you know, hopefully multi-trillion dollar 
you know, investment uh, piece of legislation that is in the works. Neil does not have the greatest track record <laughs> on this issue. I know for those who are his, his constituents, you're probably aware of this. He has been a top recipient of uh, many different types of, of corporate PACs, including fossil fuel polluters, energy utilities, and oil and gas companies uh, specifically. There have been lots of meetings with his office about this. He's not you know, entirely hostile to the idea of repealing fossil fuel subsidies. But like I said, this is going to be a push. This is going to be a fight. He is not a natural ally of ours on this. We need to make sure that Representative Neal understands that the political winds have shifted. People want leaders to take immediate action on the climate crisis and not to continue to defend the polluters, the corporate polluters um, that are the ones, in this case, bankrolling their campaigns. So again, you know, his vote and really his sort of negotiation position as chair of the committee will be instrumental in deciding whether we continue to spend these tens of billions of dollars subsidizing the fracking industry, pipelines, power plants, and all these things. Um, or if we end those subsidies and use that money again to invest in not just renewable energy, but the many, many <laughs> sort of social, environmental, uh, public health uh, programs that, that are you know, in desperate need of funding. We have been, you know, Food and Water Action have been rallying our, our members, our volunteers in his district um, throughout, really throughout 2021 to contact his office um, you know, to, to put pressure on him. I mentioned there have been constituent meetings, other groups we've been working with uh, have, been, have been lobbying him. And I think there's, there's links in the chat um, for you all to do the same. Uh, so please join us in, in contacting him, especially if you are in the district. Share that with your, with your friends and neighbors. You know, quantity, quantity matters, but the quality you know, coming from constituents is really, really important. Um, and again, his vote and his position of good negotiation is really going to be critical here. Um, so I, I'll just leave it. Actually, if you want to go to the next slide, there's, there's more to be done. Uh, oh, I might have to put it in the chat. I think there's one other slide. My um, colleague, Nisha, is our Northwest Regional Organizer, and she had a family obligation tonight. Otherwise, she would have been speaking in my place. Um, but she has been working on, on push, putting pressure on Neil, and I know there's a, there's a plan to get a, you know, a few groups in the district together and, and kind of make a plan in the next few weeks to really up the pressure on him beyond you know, writing, writing and calling the office. Um, and so I will put Nisha's contact information in the chat. Uh, so please reach out to her uh, if you are in the district and, and are looking to get started right away. Um, we've had a, a great op-ed and some other uh, letters to the editor's place. That's, a, that's an important tactic um, to kind of highlight uh, Representative Neil Neil's role in this, um, but there's certainly other things that we want to get down to working on um, in the next few, you know, critical weeks and months. Um, so again, uh, yeah, I hope you all um, take action to, to contact Neil and your other U.S. representatives, um, and I will put uh, Nisha's email in the chat for anyone in the first district who is looking to roll up their sleeves. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Okay, everyone. Um, now it's time for your second um, action minute. Um, I understand from a comment in the chat that maybe one of the links isn't working. I'm trying to get that fixed at the moment. Um, we've set up two requests for you. Um, we have a direct letter to Richie Neal um, for Massachusetts residents. This probably will not work for those of you who are not in Massachusetts because it is based on zip codes. Um, but if you're a Massachusetts resident, regardless of which district you're in, we're encouraging you to reach out to Richie Neal and explain to him how important it is um, to actually follow through and do the work, do the basic groundwork to eliminate these subsidies by getting that bill out of committee, reported out favorably. Um, so that link is in the chat now. Um, there is a second letter. Um, which we want to send to all of the Massachusetts delegation, um, excluding um, the um, this two senators because, in fact, they are already on board. Um, the at this point, so only Ayanna Presley, Representative Presley, um, and Representative Auchincloss have actually voiced support and become co-sponsors for the Stop the Polluter Welfare Act. Um, and so it's really important that we now um, thank them, but get the others on board. So the second letter um, will ask you to send 
um, a message to your constituent, to, to your congressperson, um, where you can either thank them if they've done the right thing or demand that they do the right thing. Um, and uh, hopefully both of these letters are now functional, functioning properly. Um, my apologies if they weren't earlier. Um, please, if you had problems the first time taking action, do it again. It looks like we've got lots of people taking action on the Neil letter. There's 34, 34 of you have already done it. Thank you. Um, let's move the, num the needle on the second one. Um, if you tried already and it didn't work, please try again. Um, this is all a prelude, as, as Thomas said, this isn't the only thing we're gonna try and do. Our revolution is gonna work with other organizations. You may have heard at the beginning that people from um, Progressive Democrats of America, Democratic Socialists of America, Sierra Club, um, have all agreed that we wanna build some kind of a real campaign. And so over the course of the next couple of weeks, you'll be hearing more from us um, on that. And um, one way to be sure that you hear from us is by taking action on these two letters. Um, if you can customize the letter, if you've had connections and you know, work for a candidate, um, or even if you've worked for an opponent, you know, many people challenged, uh, supported um, uh, Alex Morris during the past um, Democratic primary in District 1 um, to, over, to, to remove Neil. Let Neil know that maybe this is one of the issues that if he were to be more aggressively supportive of, you might reconsider your support for Alex Morris or any other opponent. Um, this is all about letting him, about us exercising our power. It's one thing to constantly demonstrate and protest, but we need to exercise power. And that's here, and it's also through the ballot box. Um, so again, please take action um, on both of these things. Um, and, um, uh, and, and Hal has posted in the chat that we actually have a phone dialer um, that you can use after tonight, um, tonight's presentation um, to also voice your support for the end of fossil fuel subsidies. Um, thanks everybody. Please let us know in the chat. Um, uh, if, um, if you've taken action, if there are links not working for you, please let us know. We'll, we'll track it from the chat who had problems and we'll get back to you to, to, to rectify those if in fact things aren't working right. Um, thank you, Diane. Anybody else, please let's, let's, let's contribute. Um, thank you, Mary Jane, El Jane Elise. I can't pronounce your name properly, my apologies. Um, thank you, Ferd. Um, Great, everybody's getting their, those messages done. Um, we really need to move on. We're, we've got 10 minutes left on the program. So um, I'd, I'd love it if we can move to the, um, to the next slide. We have two final presenters. Um, it's not enough to just have good financial policy, investment policy. Um, it's not enough really to just ask for good um, legislative policy and votes. Um, I don't think there's anybody on this call who believes that Keystone XL um, would have been stopped by President Biden if there hadn't been years of on the ground organizing to prevent its construction. Uh, communities, indigenous communities and peoples and their allies put their bodies on the line for a long time um, trying, to make, trying to make that issue clear to the rest of us. Um, the same thing is happening now um, in a lot of communities around the country, the one that is most prominent that could be this, a similar kind of climate time bomb um, is line three in Minnesota. And tonight we're lucky enough to have with us two people um, who have been, who are veterans of the struggle in Minnesota, Erica Williams Rodriguez from the GNU Collective and Sabina Von Mering, who's a local 350 Mass member and, um, and climate activist. And so I'm gonna turn the next part of this program over to them to hear about um, why direct action matters and what's happening in Northern Minnesota. Um, you're on. All right, <laughs> thank you, Michael. And thanks for all of you uh, to stick around even though it's been a long program already with a lot of action. Um, my name is Sabine von Meering. I use she, her pronouns, and I live on unceded Nipmuc land. I am a climate protector with 350 Mass, and I also have been teaching a class about climate change at Brandeis for over a decade. 
Um, I should add, however, that I'm speaking for myself today, neither for 350 Mass nor for Brandeis University. Uh, next slide, please. You already heard earlier that Germany experienced extreme flooding a few weeks ago, and that's personal to me because I was born in Germany. Next slide, please. Erica, you're on mute. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Erica Williams Rodriguez. Uh, I am a climate activist, community organizer, Catholic worker, and GNU collective supporter. I reside on occupied Lenin Lenape land in what is now known as Pennsylvania. My pronouns are she, her. The GNU collective is an indigenous women and two-spirit-led two frontline resistance to protect our mother earth. You may have already heard of indigenous lawyer, Tara Hauska. Tara Hauska is an environmental and indigenous rights attorney and advocate. She's a land defender and founder of the Janu Collective. And she's a, a leader of the efforts to stop line three. She is a citizen of the Kuchichang First Nation. Next slide, please. There she is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the collective's struggle to protect the water is personal to me because my, parent, my grandparents were indigenous. Uh, my grandmother's people were, were Taino uh, from Puerto Rico. Uh, her and her sisters were stripped from their homeland when they were children and they were raised and abused in a Catholic orphanage. Uh, their native language was beaten out of them in an attempt to assimilate and colonize them. Just like the many indigenous children of this nation that we continue to find mass graves of. I think my grandmother and my ancestors would appreciate my resolve and commitment to the protection of the Anishinaabe land and people. Yeah, you see here the, uh, Minnesota, the map of the U.S. with Minnesota. Next slide, please. As you heard, while Germany is underwater, the Northwest is on fire. We're also currently seeing devastating wildfires in Ontario, right to the north of the Line 3 construction site. Yet neither the U.S. nor the Canadian government seem to see the contradiction and allow Enbridge to literally add fuel to the fire. Next slide, please. So what is Line 3, right? Uh, for those who don't know yet, Line 3 is a pipeline project by Canadian energy giant Enbridge to ship tar sands oil from Alberta to Wisconsin, spanning northern Minnesota, crossing the Leech Lake and Fond du Lac reservations, and the 1855, 1854, and 1842 treaty areas. Next slide, please. This area is called the land of the 10,000 lakes because that's what it is an area full of precious and pristine waterways. Next slide, please. You can see in this slide how the pipeline expansion is being buried under literally hundreds of precious waterways and wetlands. Next slide, please. And the pipeline is being built through treaty lands of the Anishinaabe and Ojibwe tribes, crossing waterways that they have used to grow wild rice for hundreds of years. Next slide, please. If completed, line three would ship up to 1,500,000 barrels of tar sand crude oil a day, one of the dirtiest fuels on earth. The total project cost rose to $9.3 billion. The Minnesota segment is 4 billion. Next slide, please. The climate impacts from this pipeline are enormous. It would transport enough oil to produce about 170 billion kilograms of carbon dioxide per year, equivalent to about 50 coal power plants or 38 million vehicles on our roads. It is a carbon bomb, just like KXL. Next slide, please. The Keystone XL pipeline, which President Biden canceled on his first day in office after he had said so movingly in his inaugural address, quote, a cry for survival comes for the planet from the planet itself, a cry that can't be any more desperate or any more clear now, unquote. And yet he has been silent and has continued to allow line three to proceed. 
Under Biden's watch, the planet's cry is becoming more desperate by the day. Next slide, please. Indigenous water protectors and their allies have been fighting against the pipeline project for over seven years, ever since it was first proposed. Next slide, please. When construction started last winter, they began their civil disobedience actions to protect the water. Next fourth slides, please. These are some pictures of uh, some of the actions that have been taking place in Minnesota. Uh, and they urged others to join them to protect our water and our climate. Thousands have responded to the call. In the beginning of June of this year, Sabine and I too went to Northern Minnesota to support them and protest the construction of line three. Next slide, please. We found a heartbreaking situation, a gorgeous landscape that is brimming with life, butterflies and dragonflies the size of your hand and breathtaking waterways, including the Mississippi, right, which you see right here, which is almost small enough there to jump across but next slide, please. The land and the water cannot protect themselves from a multi-billion dollar energy corporation like Enbridge, whose pipelines have had dangerous spills. The primary, primary US subsidiary at Enbridge Energy has reported 173 incidents since 2002, along with many others. So you can show the next few slides now as Erica tells you more. Mm -hmm. We also discovered an incredibly resilient community of indigenous women, two-spirit people, and their allies who are putting their bodies in the way of the pipeline to protect the water and the climate for all of us. Their selfless dedication is truly inspiring. By now, thousands <clears throat> of water, excuse me, <clears throat> by now thousands of water protectors have gone to the front lines and hundreds have been arrested. Next two slides, please. Yeah. So that includes us. We got arrested on June 15 and have since been charged, like many of our fellow protesters, with felony theft. Though there is no question in our minds who the true criminals are who are aiming to profit from fossil fuels at a time of climate emergency. So you, the next two so, slides. This is Sabine uh, here, and uh, there I am. <laughs> next slide, please. Enbridge has also been providing the local police with $1 million and has used these resources, for example, uh, in many ways. But for example, one of the ways they used it was to blockade the entrance to uh, private property where uh, a camp is. Next slide, please. Earlier this week, indigenous water protectors, including Tara Hauska and Winona LeDuc, filed a lawsuit against the county, the sheriff and the local land commissioner for quote, illegally constructing a de facto open air prison, blockading their property. Next slide, please. Winona LeDuc. Yeah. Winona LeDuc was arrested herself and held in jail for three days. Next two slides, please. While the police are busy harassing water protectors, next slide, please. That drill you saw in the pictures is now being used to drill trenches underneath the Mississippi and hundreds of waterways and wetlands. And as we mentioned, there have already been several spills of dangerous chemicals. Next slide, please. Next slide. Water, please. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's okay. Water protectors continue to say no. And we hope you too are moved to support them by going to Minnesota, by talking to everyone around you about line three and by taking action now. Thank you. So we have homework for you. <laughs> yes. Next slide, please. There's homework here. Two fast actions, sign the petition that's in the chat, to President Biden to stop line three and support the people on the front lines 
with a contribution to the GoFundMe. So both um, should be in the chat at this point, hopefully. <laughs> and I guess Thanks. we're handing, handing it back to Michael, right? Thank you so much, um, Erica and Sabina. I think all of us um, are, are deeply appreciative of your willingness to, to go to, go to the front line, to be a body on the front line, um, and um, asking asking all of us to not just uh, sort of emotionally support you, but to do what we can to make that easier for you and others to continue to do that. And for those of us who are willing to make that extra jump ourselves, um, the, the 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 pipelines the, the 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 risks to the the to the climate criminals are not just loss of funding at the federal or state pension level but there is reputational risk there is power in these in these um, actions that really um, make it clear to the American public that this is no longer an acceptable way of doing business so please Everybody take a moment to sign the petition to the president asking him to do what he already did for Keystone XL um, and then make a contribution directly to um, the GNU Collective so that um, the people on the front lines have the resources they need to be able to continue this important work. Um, in a moment, I've got one more action for you. Um, before we get to that, um, uh, I want to turn things over briefly to Hal to talk about um, what's happening with Our Revolution National. Um, go ahead, Hal. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. And I just want to say I'm in awe of those two women that we just heard from. Sabina and uh, Erica are obviously their climate heroes. And to, uh, to actually sacrifice their freedom, I mean, that's what a, a patriot is. A patriot is someone who's willing to sacrifice for their country. And I don't think anyone fits that definition better than um, the two women that we just heard from, Erica uh, Williams Rodriguez and Sabina, uh, professor at Brandeis and with 350 Mass. So I want to thank you both, Sabina Von Mering and Erica uh, Williams Rodriguez. I mean, I just, um, yeah, I mean, that's all I can really say. I am going to just quickly, if you can do slide there, Henry, we do ask again, I've been putting them in the chat a few times. I don't want to belabor this, but yeah, these events do do require resources. So if you are in a position, we do say, hey, go to ourrev.us uh, slash M-A-M-E-M. -E and if you can contribute, we greatly appreciate it. So thank you very, very much for that. I'm going to go ahead and just put those links in there. I think they went to the wrong place for some reason. I'm not happy about that, but I'll try one more time to get also because we do have a, uh, a, a phone uh, which you can use to reach your le uh, legislator, your rep, your congressional representative, whoever they are, not just Richie Neal, though it would go to Neal, uh, to just say no subsidies to polluters. Uh, all right, next slide, uh, Henry, please. So yeah, those are our five point plan to win. And obviously this is a progressive powerhouse right here in Massachusetts. I love that they have action groups like the Climate Crisis Action Group. Uh, we are holding politicians accountable like Richie Neal, electing progressive champions uh, like Ed Markey, for example, who is a sponsor of the End uh, Polluter Welfare Act in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the Senate, fighting for progressive policies and building a progressive party. Next slide, Henry, please. And by the way, I just said slide. I should, don't have to say next slide. Henry, slide. <laughs> is, is he stuck? Uh, we have demands as well. I don't know. It doesn't seem to want to go to the next slide. I'm not really clear what that's about, but uh, yeah, there you go. So this is what you chose as the most important uh, priorities, starting with voting rights. We are fighting for the People Act healthcare. Uh, right now, we're focusing on Medicare expansion because that can happen, and we believe that is a step towards Medicare for all, an important step, and will improve the lives of tens of millions of Americans. Uh, you heard all about the climate crisis right here. I don't even want to call it climate change. The climate crisis uh, worse uh, keeps getting worse than anyone thought it would be. Uh, we have to tax the rich. Actually, inequality and the climate crisis go hand in hand. You have both uh, feeding off each other. And good jobs, of course, we're fighting for. That's what is most important to you. Slide, Henry. Um, so there we go. Uh, yeah, and... It, 
So as I mentioned, Medicare expansion, that's what we're focused on right now. I think the Massachusetts delegation is pretty good on this, but if you know of any representatives in Congress who are not, obviously Markey and Warren in the Senate are both uh, for this legislation as well as uh, Medicare for All, we believe. Uh, but if you have a Congress member who isn't, and I'm not sure that there is anyone who's opposed to it at this point, um, please pressure them. Slide. There you go. We already saw a picture of that, uh, Representative Omar, with uh, our Executive Director, Joseph Givarghese, fighting to end the fossil fuel subsidies. The link is in the chat, and I really do appreciate Thomas putting that image in as well. Slide. I think that's, uh, yeah, this is, this is what our billionaires are doing. And of course, it's incredibly destabilizing to their climate. Think of how much fossil fuels are required to just send one of these, these vanity projects that have no value whatsoever. Uh, again, inequality is a major driver of our climate crisis. Slide. Uh, Henry fight. Uh, there's a, uh, I don't know if said that's Henry. No, that's not Henry. That's, <laughs> that's uh, Senator Sanders there. And he is, uh, continues to fight for us. Our founder, uh, Bernie Sanders slide. Yeah, we need Biden to fight to end that filibuster because otherwise we get nothing done. Uh, slide. And we are pressuring Chuck Schumer as well to act on the For the People Act, as well as ending that filibuster. In fact, some of the money that we've been, uh, we are collecting now that we're raising is used for organizers on the ground in both West Virginia and Arizona to pressure Senators Mama. Manchin, Cinema, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mark, uh, I forget his name, Giffords, Mark Giffords. Okay, I think we're, that should be my last slide, but go ahead one more, Henry. And that does it for me. We are fighting for voting rights. Let me turn it back to Mike, Michael Gilbreth to end the call. Thank you all. Thanks, Hal. I want to encourage everybody to make a contribution um, to OR National. And also, there we're, we're continuing to post the links for the Stop Line 3 petition um, and, and the GoFundMe for the frontline activists in Minnesota. Please do what you can. Um, to take those actions. And as Sabina suggests, make sure you're sending all these to your friends. You know, Every time you send out a, a link like this to three or four or seven other people, you're more than doubling the power of your own signature, your own voice. And that's what we need. We need to build a movement that is um, as, as prepared for the crisis as the, sol as the solutions that we demand. We demand Congress and corporations um, come up with plans that, that will match the scale of the crisis. We need a movement that will match the scale of the crisis, and that's not going to happen from a couple hundred people on the phone tonight. It's going to happen when those couple hundred people inspire another couple hundred, et cetera. Um, the um, last pitch for our organization, for Our Revolution Massachusetts, and the Climate Action Group, also known as our, as our Climate uh, Crisis Working Group, um, we will be in touch over the course of the next week about things you can do to work, um, uh, to work on Representative Neal. Um, this is not the end. This is the beginning. Uh, my apologies for the links. I think we're, we're, we're uh, complicated by the fact that uh, our back end system uh, expects to find people writing to their constituents, to constituents writing to their reps and not to other people's reps. And so I think that's where the breakdown is tonight. We will fix that. You will get a link that will allow you to communicate with Richie Neal. Second thing you can do is to, um, and we'll follow up about that campaign. The second thing you can do is, is our group, our working force focused a lot on um, the, the, the fact that nature, if we leave it alone, if we let it do its job, instead of logging it, cutting it down or degrading it, can actually be one of the key solutions to um, the rising carbon problem but only if we let it. So we've been working for a while now on the Massachusetts legislature to stop commercial logging on Massachusetts public lands. There is a link on the screen and it will be posted in the chat in a moment that will allow you to add your voice if you're a Massachusetts resident and um, to write to your state rep um, and your state senator and ask them to support the existing legislation um, in the state house. You can reach us directly at climate at ourrevolutionmah.com. Um, please do. 
Let us know if you want to be a part of our group, if you want to be a part of this organization. Um, we will show you how we meet on the first and third Monday of every month um, and would love to have you join us. Um, our Facebook group is, is listed here on the slide and I believe will be posted in the chat. Um, and the um, Climate Change Green New Deal page on the Our Revolution Massachusetts website is also listed. Those are all ways to find out more about what we're doing, but the best thing to do is to email us at climate at ourrevolutionmath.com. Um, I wanna thank everybody for participating tonight. Um, I think we've heard in a really important program, watch for our follow-up email in the next 24 to 48 hours. It should have a corrected link for Richie Neal. Um, and we'll have all of the links that you've heard tonight, plus some others, um, all about taking action. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, Hal, I, I, think, I, I think we can call it a wrap. Great job, everybody. And you want to lead us out with our chant? If everybody would put your microphones on. We do have a, um, a standard call um, and response. Um, when we organize, we win. When we organize, <laughs> we win. And that's what's happening. That's what CFA is doing. That's what the GNU Collective is doing. That's what Food and Water Action is doing. And that's what our revolution, National and Massachusetts, is working hard to do. Um, so thank you for helping us continue the organizing. Get active. Stay active. Thank you. Bye-bye.